Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. The thank you to the organizing committee for uh, inviting me to give you this talk today. Um, as with most uh, radiology uh, lectures, uh, this will have uh, pictures. Um, maybe a little bit less on the evidence because I like to tell uh, stories and anecdotal examples of our experience here in Chinese uh, General Hospital. Um, unfortunately, uh, sad to say, I have uh, uh, no uh, conflicts of interest to declare. Okay, so um, today, uh, briefly, I will go through. Um, let me just see if I. Okay, how do I get the. Uh, is it a. Is it? Yeah, okay, alright. Okay, so um, a, a little brief introduction to um, the various tools that your ED physicians have actually at their disposal uh, in terms of working out a, a patient with uh, acute chest pain. Um, I'd like to highlight some practical protocol issues because it can be actually quite con uh, confusing, you know, all the different scans, what's the difference, you know, can I use this scan for that uh, kind of a patient. Um, we'll talk a little bit about indications, uh, patient selection, and uh, what the various uh, bodies have, have come uh, into consensus in terms of uh, utilizing the different tools. And I'm actually very, very uh, happy that uh, Professor Mark actually sort of kind of emphasized a little bit on uh, clinical judgment and that sort of thing because um, radiologists always face this uh, a problem of having to uh, kind of like step up sometimes when, when uh, time is short and, and the patient is actually not evaluated uh, properly. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about our implementation of how we, we fit in uh, coronary uh, CT angiograms in, the, in this ED workup of uh, patients with chest pain. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the actual uh, 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 scans itself and I'll show you some examples. Okay, so uh, don't need to tell you that a uh, patient with the acute chest pain uh, is a common and expensive pro uh, problem that is seen in ED. It's the second most common uh, reason patients end up in the a &E department. It's a common cause of litigation against uh, uh, a &E physicians in the US. You know, patient comes in, gets worked up, uh, for some reason gets discharged and then uh, dies while he's, you know, in the toilet or something like that and, and he gets sued. Okay, so again, the goal is to try and accurately triage patients who need admission for workup and uh, to discharge uh, patients who, who do not uh, with early TCUs or uh, assessments at the outpatient clinic. Okay, so basically, um, the patient comes in with acute chest pain in, in the ED, right? I mean, the, these are probably the three big uh, uh, categories of, of conditions that they could be suffering. So, is it an acute aortic syndrome? You know, does the patient have an aortic aneurysm? Is it a dissection? Is it an acute intramural? Uh, hematoma. And obviously, uh, ideally, if the patients uh, patients went to school, they were coming with a classical tearing chest pain. You know, they got trauma, they got positive risk factors, they got all the clinical signs to point. You know, uh, that the patients got aortic aneurysm or dissection, and you know, the chest X-ray shows me this spinal widening, etc., and that sort of thing. Okay, and then obviously you have the uh, other patients who come in with uh, cardiogenic causes of uh, their chest pain. Okay, so it could be an uh, AMI, could be unstable angina. Okay, do they have the classic? Uh, 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 clinical symptoms of a, a patient with AMI sweating, you know, the radiation down the arm and that sort of thing. Uh, do they have the risk factors, the TV score very high, is the ECG characteristic, the cardiac enzymes elevated? Okay, so those we don't have a problem. Okay, and then um, another subgroup of patients who can come in with chest pain, shortness of breath, uh, would be the patients who have pulmonary uh, embolism. So again, you know, is the history typical, you know, do they have swollen legs, uh, is a patient on oral contraceptive pills, do they just come in from a flight from um, um, from the uh, UK with a stopover in Australia. I noticed that seems to be the most common uh, flight uh, itinerary for patients coming with uh, pulmonary embolism. Um, you know, the D-dimers elevated, is the ECG typical, etc., that sort of thing. Uh, but as we all know in real life, right, um, that there is a subset of patients that actually don't really fit nicely into any of these categories and, and there's always a little bit of uncertainty as to uh, what these uh, patients uh, uh, actually have. And these tend to be uh, slightly younger patients who come in with atypical presentation, you know, the TV is less than 4, the ECG is either normal or critical, uh, the chest x-ray doesn't show any either spinal widening or anything like that, and uh, maybe the cardiac enzymes are normal or critical. Okay, so, um, so what, what can you do as far as radiology is concerned uh, uh, for these patients? Well, there are a whole bunch of tests, you can order CT autogram, CT primary angiogram, uh, coronary CTs, triple rule outs, okay? And they are each designed actually specifically to address a specific clinical question, all right? And um, 
the protocols uh, to actually perform these studies are all a little bit different. Okay, so for example, the CT aortogram is a triple phase study. It's time to actually uh, show the best enhancement in the aorta to look for all the uh, dissections, the aneurysms, and the intramural hematomas. The pulmonary angiogram obviously is a single phase study. It's time to show opacification of contrast in the pulmonary arteries to look for the um, endoline and the pulmonary arteries. The coronary CT study is usually an ECG gated study, okay, small field of view. Um, we're looking at a very, very uh, rigorous kind of like heart rate control because you want actually good quality uh, studies because the coronary arteries are actually not very big. Okay, there are a lot of uh, considerations uh, to take into account when um, deciding whether this patient's scan is going to turn out well. And then uh, re recently we have this thing called the trooper rollout, which is an attempt at a one-stop shot to kind of like assess all these structures at the same time. Now, um, I'll go a little bit into uh, some of the pitfalls with uh, triple rule out and why in general radiologists actually don't really like uh, to do these uh, studies unless they're absolutely necessary. Okay, so just uh, some pictorial examples to kind of like emphasize what the difference in the various protocols are. So if you look at this patient sitting on the gram, okay, he's got a Stanford type A. Uh, dissection, the contrast is mainly in the uh, aorta. Okay, this is not an ECG data study, that's why I can see a little bit of motion artifact in the ascending aorta. Um, actually, if you do suspect that the patient has got an uh, thoracic aortic aneurysm, ideally you would actually prefer to do the study as an ECG data study, but sometimes that's not uh, possible. Uh, for the coronary CT angiogram, okay, it's, it's much smaller uh, field of view to try and reduce the radiation. Okay, contrast is actually optimized to demonstrate the uh, coronary arteries, okay, and most of the contrast, as you, as you can see, is in the left side of the heart, nice opacification of the left ventricle. And the exact opposite is actually seen in the uh, pulmonary angiogram, where there's basically no contrast in the aorta, all the contrast is in the pulmonary arteries and in the right ventricle uh, for obvious reasons, because you actually want to look for the filling defects in the pulmonary arteries. Okay, so... Um, uh, this is a patient who came in with a Stafford type A dissection. This is the pre-contrast study to look for high-density intramural hematoma. This is the arterial phase to show the contrast in the aorta. And usually we have a delayed phase to kind of look for differential enhancement. So usually uh, what happens is that the true lumen will opacify first, and then the false lumen opacifies a little bit later. But in this patient, there was almost a similar uh, contrast opacification. Okay. Uh, this is another elderly patient who came in with uh, chest pain and the uh, chest x-ray was actually uh, pretty abnormal. He had all the classical symptoms and the CT audiogram showed a very large uh, kind of like contained rupture of the, uh, of the uh, aorta because he actually had a uh, proximal thoracic descending aorta uh, aneurysm. Okay, um, anybody know what's going on in this patient? Okay, so uh, most of the contrast is in the right ventricle. Okay, so this is a pulmonary angiogram. Is it normal or abnormal? Okay, who thinks this is a normal study? Put up your hand. Who thinks this is a normal study? Put up your hand. Okay, so nobody knows what's going on. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Uh, okay, so actually this patient's got very extensive pulmonary embolism. Okay, this is the, the, the pulmonary trunk. Okay, and that's the left descending pulmonary artery. And you can see there's this actually big... Uh, uh, sort of a tubular filling defect. It looks a little bit like the clots that uh, <laughs> we showed you earlier on. Okay, and the right ventricle is huge. Okay, it's really, really dilated. Okay, so this patient actually had um, excessive pulmonary embolism with the right ventricular stream. Okay, what about this guy? Okay, um, this is actually quite interesting patient. He came in uh, with uh, chest pain and the ECG was kind of like equivocal. The first set of uh, uh, cardiac enzymes and trout was actually kind of like uh, normal, right? And um, uh, so, so we're wondering, okay, you know, maybe this patient's got aortic dissection, you know, his pain is quite severe and that sort of thing. So this, this was in the old days. Um, we didn't actually wait for all the enzymes to come back. Like, they called me up and said, well, you know, can you just you know, make sure he doesn't have an aortic dissection because his chest pain is actually quite bad. So uh, we did a coronary, uh, we, we did a CT aortogram and actually this uh, shows quite, quite nicely that he has actually no evidence of dissection or aortic aneurysm. But... Um, in the uh, delay uh, phase of the uh, uh, CT, we actually showed, uh, we actually thought we saw saw a little bit of this subendocardial hypo enhancement in the in the apex of the um, uh, of the uh, left uh, ventricle. So it's a question of whether he uh, had a uh, subendocardial uh, maybe infarction in the left apex, you know, possibly maybe in the LED uh, territory. 
So um, after he did the scan, then after that he went back, and then uh, his uh, cardiac enzymes then went up. So um, so eventually he went for echo, which uh, showed some uh, SWM, uh, some segmental wall motion abnormality. But interestingly, his uh, cat after that was uh, normal. So we weren't really sure at the end of the day whether he really had a, a thrombus or basal spasm or whatever. But uh, certainly there was something going on in the uh, in the in the left ventricular apex. So sometimes um, when we report these uh, uh, CT autograms, we can occasionally pick up uh, you know MIs. Uh, but please don't order this particular study. <laughs> okay, it's only if we're lucky, right? Okay, um, uh, this particular uh, CT was actually done for a patient with a uh, known uh, acute myocardial infarction, okay? And I think the cardiologists will all point out to you that, hey, look, you know, this part of the, it's a huge infarct, you know, this part of the uh, left ventricle is not enhancing at all. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so we were quite happy to say, yes, yes, we agree with you, there is a myocardial uh, in fact, but uh, he didn't actually have anything uh, going on in his um, uh, aorta. He didn't have a uh, thoracic, uh, like I said, I mean, he didn't have an aneurysm or dissection or any of that sort of thing. However, um, although this was actually done to optimize uh, contrast in the aorta, uh, we actually also had contrast in the pulmonary arteries, all right? And we actually saw filling defects in the subsegmental uh, arteries of the uh, left lower lobe. So this was actually a patient uh, day for uh, LADMI mode. Subsequently, uh, she developed uh, pulmonary embolism. Okay, um, this is just to show you uh, uh, how uh, a non-ECG gated uh, CT aortogram can actually cause problems uh, for the radiologist in terms of by diagnosing uh, aortic dissection. Okay, so this is a patient who came in with chest pain, and there was quite a lot of motion artifact in the uh, in the scans, and you know you're looking at this and wondering whether there is an intimal flap. So. Um, Okay, la, actually, I, I can tell you this is not a flat, la, okay, but not everybody is as confident as me. So, the <laughs> patient came back, uh, of course they weren't sure, uh, Stephen Kam said, I'm not sure whether there is an aortic dissection. So, we repeated the scan with ECG gating just to prove to him that there wasn't any dissection. Okay, so, useful ECG gating. Okay, so, um, so, you've got all these tools, right? So, wh when do you use them? Okay, so uh, rather than, I think, show uh, individual uh, studies and what they've shown, I'm just going to show you uh, appropriateness criteria and consensus statements. So, this is a uh, appropriateness criteria for a patient with uh, acute chest pain who's suspected to have pulmonary embolism. And, okay, basically, the higher the rating, the more appropriate the study. The uh, larger number of uh, radiation symptoms obviously means there's more radiation. Okay, so uh, a chest x-ray is actually quite appropriate in these patients just to exclude other causes of chest pain, I don't know, pneumonia, that sort of thing. But generally, the CT uh, angiogram uh, of the pulmonary arteries uh, ranks extremely uh, high in terms of, uh, in fact, it's pretty much replaced pulmonary and angiograms of all in terms of being the first-line imaging modality to diagnose uh, pulmonary embolism. Uh, we try not to do uh, CT angiograms with the CT phenographies because actually the pickup rate is actually quite low for the DVTs. And we also have a lot of protocol and timing issues when we do both at the same time. Okay, so uh, again, for patients, acute chest pain, suspected aortic dissection, uh, coronary CT, and, uh, not coronary CT, CT aortograms actually rank very highly. It's a first uh, line imaging study. Okay, so now we go to the interesting one, right? Because all the others we already know. Okay, it's a low probability of coronary artery disease, okay? And, um, if cardiology is suspected, uh, CTA coronary arteries with contrast actually ranks reasonably high, 7 uh, after your X-ray chest and your uh, spec rest and, and, and stress study. Uh, unfortunately, it's very hard to wake up uh, perhaps the nuclear cardiologist or the nuclear medicine doctor at 3 a.m. in the morning, so maybe people want to do CTs more. Uh, okay. Um, okay, so um, this uh, whole bunch of people uh, came together and released this uh, appropriateness uh, criteria in, in 2010 for uh, the use of uh, cardiac uh, computed tomography. And I just want to kind of like highlight um, certain points about this, okay? The first, right, is that if your patient comes in with acute uh, symptoms, suspicious or acute coronary sy uh, uh, syndrome, okay, urgent presentation, if your patient has definite signs of AMI, there is no reason you should order a CT coronary angiogram, okay? It is inappropriate, I for inappropriate, all right? Please do not waste time calling the radiologist and trying to get the scan, okay? The uh, evidence is a little bit more uncertain for patients who have persistent ECG, FC segment elevation. 
uh, following the exclusion of MI and acute chest pain of uncertain cause. So the jury is a little bit out there in terms of patients coming in with uh, this sort of thing. Okay. Now, pretest probability of coronary artery disease, uh, coronary CT angiogram may be appropriate all right, in patients with low pretest probability and intermediate uh, pretest probability. And for those with high pretest probability, then again, the evidence is a little bit more um, uncertain. Okay, um, this is actually a slightly older consensus update. This was actually published uh, in the Journal of Basic Cardiology in 2007. Um, I show this um, uh, to say that uh, only a small proportion of emergency room patients with acute chest pain may be suitable for CT evaluation due to many exclusionary criteria for the performance of CTA in the uh, ER setting. And they actually list out very uh, pertinent and practical issues why you should be very careful about these things. So you, you need a lot of stuff, okay? You need, you, need, uh, you need a high quality scanner, okay? You need to be able to have staffing to actually control the heart rate a little bit better so that you get quality images, okay? Um, and the recommendation, at least from this paper, is that uh, rather than trying to do a suboptimal CT coronary angiogram in the middle of the night where maybe a more junior person who's uh, reading the scans at, uh, in the department, it might be actually better to wait until the next day when you actually have more manpower and man, more resources to actually do a proper uh, uh, CT coronary angiogram. Um, the other thing that this particular paper uh, suggested really was that it was not recommended to perform triple ruler on a routine basis. Okay, and again, I will explain why. Okay. Um, the triple ruler protocol is rarely needed for the cardiac CTA and ER. And basically what they say is that you really should try and decide for your patient which dedicated study is required to meet uh, the, to answer the specific clinical question. And in the vast majority of the cases, right, you should be able to tell whether your patient's having acute aortic syndrome, acute coronary syndrome, or pulmonary embolism. And there's only a very small group of patients that actually you can't actually differentiate where the triple rule out may be helpful. Okay. All right, uh, back to that other paper in 2010. Okay, uh, again, it was suggested that the triple rollout should not be used as a routine kind of like uh, imaging uh, uh, study for, for patients where you're not really sure what the chest pain is and you want to be kiasu and exclude everything. Okay, so no kiasu isn't allowed. Okay, so patient selection is important and your patient should, wherever possible, receive the scan tailored to the most likely diagnosis. Okay, CT coronary angiogram in the ED has a role to play in a specific group of, of, of patients. Triple rollout can be performed, but even in a smaller, more select group of patients. And you better make sure you have a high spec scanner capable of low radiation doses and that sort of thing. And obviously, the vendors have come out with very uh, many wonderful machines, dual source CT from Siemens, 128, or more uh, uh, CT scanners from Toshiba and the rest. Okay. All right, so uh, this is another algorithm to kind of try and help you uh, triage which patients uh, should go for a CT coronary angiogram. And again, if it's a definite MI, please do not send them to us, okay? For the other patients with low pretest, intermediate pretest, uh, pretest probability, you can consider doing a uh, CT angiogram. Okay, so, so um, why is there all this move to try and uh, get, you know, uh, CT imaging uh, for acute coronary uh, syndrome uh, as, a, as a viable tool for, for ED physicians? Well, uh, obviously, we, most modern hospitals now have very uh, good CT scanners, okay? The good thing about CT coronary angiogram is the negative predictive value is very good. So if I tell you that the scan is completely normal, right, only 2% of these patients will actually have significant coronary artery disease and go on to have uh, uh, some kind of cardiac morbidity. Now the positive predictive value, at uh, least uh, 64 MBCT results, is a little bit more variable. Okay? So we're good at telling you when it's normal. Uh, we're not quite as good at telling you uh, when it's abnormal, uh, if it's abnormal and how abnormal it is Okay, in terms of... Uh, uh, actually um, uh, telling you degrees of stenosis. And again, this depends on how much calcified plaque the patient in and a lot of other technical factors. The gold standard is still catheter coronary angiogram, but obviously CT coronary angiogram will give you further imaging information like whether there are anomalous uh, coronary arteries, you know, myocardial bridges and other uh, congenital abnormalities uh, that may be a little bit difficult to show on uh, coronary um, uh, cath angiograms. Okay, so uh, contraindications, all right, I put this inverted commas because um, 
there really aren't any like strict cor uh, contraindications anymore because uh, you know, if your patient's got arrhythmia, yeah, okay, you can still do the scan, keep your fingers crossed, hope it comes out okay. And if the scanner is actually a good scanner, you know, we've got uh, like, like a 320 scanner, uh, you can actually still get away with uh, diagnostic images. Uh, grossly obese patients, um, uh, basically, uh, you need a lot of X-ray photons to penetrate these patients. So sometimes the picture comes out very noisy and it's very hard to actually uh, read the scans because um, the picture quality is just not there. Okay. Um, uh, heart rate control is still very important, uh, even with all these multi-spice uh, scanners. And in Changi, I want the heart rate to be less than 60 beats per minute. So if the patient has got no contraindications to beta blockers, we actually beta block them. Um, okay, I, I think I have to move a little bit faster. Okay, so all these uh, contraindications, usual, contrast, GDM, etc. Okay, uh, patient preparation, uh, you want a large ball plug, avoid caffeine, all these things. Okay, heart rate BP monitoring, so you need to have a setup for that. Okay, in the scanner, the radiographer will actually teach the patient breath holding exercise. If the auntie is demented and cannot understand instructions, then you know you're, you're, you're going to have a crap time trying to read the, the scans. Okay, um, GTN is actually given uh, to vasodilate the coronary arteries, and as mentioned, I want the heart rate to be less than 60 beats per minute. Okay, so uh, what we've done in Changi General Hospital is we actually have a low risk chest pain protocol. Okay, so we've got a whole bunch of instructions for AD doctors, we have a whole bunch of instructions for our SSU doctors. Okay, and generally the patients get referred to me um, if, let's say, the patient's not uh, fit for uh, stress testing, ECG, etc., that sort of thing, or for whatever reason cannot perform that study, then we will give the patient a coronary CT angiogram appointment within 48 hours. Okay, we can't do it step because of. Um, uh, uh, limitation in terms of resources and, and we don't actually have enough slots uh, in our CD scanner. Okay, and then we've actually worked out, you know, how to order the scan, you know, what kind of a thing to, to put down on the report and then uh, we have our entire uh, abnormal result uh, workflow, okay, to actually uh, try and get the patients back early if they need it. Okay, so on to the good stuff, right? Okay, so this is a 53-year-old uh, Malay man admitted to SSU under the chest pain protocol, uh, exertional chest pain relief request. His ECG and cardiac enzymes normal. This guy was actually a taxi driver. Okay, so we did the coronary CT and lo and behold, he actually had a uh, quite severe stenosis in the proximal LAD. This is a curved planar reformation of the LAD. Okay, and he also had uh, quite severe stenosis in the uh, uh, right coronary artery. So we thought he actually had two vessel disease and um, circumflex was fine. Okay, and then we did some, uh, obviously, call, uh, measurements of the degree of stenosis, and this is uh, volume rendered. Uh, image to show the narrowing in the right coronary artery, narrowing in the left, uh, anterior descending, and true enough, CAT showed 95% uh, stenosis in the PLD and 90% stenosis in RCA. So this patient was actually called back early, uh, back to because we did not want him to be driving taxis like this. Okay, um, this is another patient, 55-year-old man admitted to SSU, same thing, ECG, cardiac enzymes were normal. Okay, also had significant sickle vessel disease in the uh, LAD. Okay, but his right coronary artery and his circumflex were actually pristine. Okay, uh, and then when they did the CAT, they found a 90% uh, stenosis in the uh, proximal LAD. So thankfully, he did not um, go home and have uh, uh, something bad happen to him. Okay, this was a 60-year-old man presented in EHS pain, and he had abnormal ECGs and cardiac enzymes. Okay, and he was admitted to the cardiac department, but um, he didn't want to do angio first. Okay, he was a bit scared, so they said, okay, we'll do CT scan. Okay, so CT just showed uh, um, a uh, occlusion of the uh, right uh, proximal to mid uh, coronary artery with a CTO, okay, chronic uh, uh, body occlusion. Okay, and then went on to do a cath angiogram, which actually showed that there was a uh, CTO in the right coronary artery. Okay, and then sometimes we get funny things. Like, okay, so like this guy uh, went to a &E for chest pain, subsequently got referred to cardio, and then actually had a... Anyone know what this is? Okay, this is a uh, fistula between the uh, pulmonary artery and the uh, LED. Okay, so the uh, cardiac scan actually shows quite nicely. He's got a little bit of aneurysmal dilatation as well. Um, so he had a fistula, it was actually probably causing some degree of steals um, and the symptoms. Okay, this one is a funny one, okay? 
Uh, this is a 40-year-old uh, Indian lady who was referred from Raffles Medical Group. Uh, had a flight from KL to Singapore, then became breathless, then went to RMG, noted hyperventilation, ST depression, inferior leads. Her brother also noted she had a similar episode when she flew from Penang. So, I uh, don't know what airline she flew, but anyway. Uh, family history of uh, ischemic heart disease. Okay, ECG showed sinus tachy, cardiac enzymes times 3 was negative, she had a bit of anemia. And then the question was, you know, oh, okay, is it PE or myocardial infarction? Okay, so uh, uh, as radiologists, I always might show you my radiology home video. This is my home video. Okay, so this shows a uh, triple rule out. Okay, so we try to time it where you get contrast in the left side of the uh, heart as well as the right side of the heart. But you'll notice that in this scan, actually, there's more contrast in the right side of the heart than the left side of the heart. So it's a little bit difficult to actually time it perfectly. But anyway, we, we decided that actually she probably didn't have any. Okay, so she had no aortic dissection, no aortic aneurysm, no uh, coronary artery stenosis, and no PE. Okay. Um, this is literally the history that I got for my other face, T R O I H E P A T. Okay, I kid you not. Um, yeah, so again, uh, this one, opposite problem, okay? So I had very little contrast in the palmy arteries, and all the contrast went into the left uh, ventricle. But it's probably enough to, for me to tell you, okay, la, there's no big PE in the, in the, in the palmy arteries, okay? And it's um, coronaries, okay? Image quality not that great, okay, a little bit of uh, blurring and stuff like that, but it looks reasonably decent. Okay, so um, I haven't actually got a positive T triple rollout, so these are some pictures I took off the internet of triple rollouts which show a patient who's got very severe pulmonary embolism. Uh, this was a patient who had a stenosis in the LVT. Okay, so challenges in implementing. Um, okay, so again, please clinical uh, examination, all right? straight patient selection. You've got to have the people to be able to do your heart rate, blood pressure monitoring, the ED, or the radiology department if you want this to take off. Okay, and preferably you want to have 24-hour radiographer expertise to do the scans and 24-hour radiologist uh, expertise to do the scans, which unfortunately at CGH we do not have, uh, which is why we have this 48-hour appointment thing. Okay, so you need your guidelines and protocols, okay, you need to work out your manpower issues, you need to work out your manpower expertise issues. So these were a little, some suggestions uh, for you to take home. Okay, so I've briefly gone through this, I apologize for going over time. Okay, some references. Uh, people, if you want slides, you can just email me, I'll give you my slides. And uh, that's the end of my talk, thank you.